Good morning, church. How are you? Hey, like you just heard, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Rock Ridge Church, and I am completely honored to get to bring the Word of God to us this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15 this morning. We're going to be studying, breaking down a, par- a, a portion of Luke chapter 15. Before that, I want to quickly recap this sort of mini-series that we've been going through. This is the finale, the fourth week of this series, and uh, could you go back um, to the uh, initial slide for me, Sydney? Thank you. So this is the, what we've gone through, how to be a quitter, how to care less, how to live out of control, and how to, this week, how to miss out on what we deserve. So week one, we talked about how to be a quitter, meaning how do we say no to good things so we can say yes to what God has for us, right? How do we discern the will of God? How do you say no to good things and say yes to God things? The second week uh, was what? Anybody remember? Go back to the first slide. How to care less. Meaning, how do we care less about what others think so that we can just care more for others, right? And then the third week, how to live out of control. Not meaning how to, have not, how, how to not have any self-control, but really how do we give up control? How, 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 do we, how do we hand over the helm to Jesus? And so we have these questions. Now you can go to those questions. How do you say no to good things and yes to God things? Secondly, we, we, uh, we uh, worked on, worked through, what, uh, what tables are you striving to sit at that Jesus would have overturned? And last week, where are you straining at the oars? Remember that picture of straining at the oars instead of trusting Jesus at the helm of our ship. So that's where we've come from, and we're going to walk this morning into the last and final one, how to miss out on what we deserve. Uh, this week is all about entitlement. And when we think about entitlement, what do we think of? (laughs) Anyone but ourselves, right? (laughs) Like Everybody else is entitled, but I got it squared away. And when we think about entitlement, what typically comes to mind? We typically think about the people who think that they deserve something that they didn't earn, right? Like That's kind of the typical understanding of entitlement. And that, my friends, is certainly not us. I mean, look at us, right? We, We are beautiful we're smart, we're working hard, we got it together. That is not who we are. But I see, I think there's this other kind of entitlement that, that, that is much more sneaky and it rests underneath the surface of all of our lives. And it's this type of entitlement that says, no, I have earned it and I do deserve what I have earned. And I'll tell you, it it is devastating to our lives when we fall into the trap of fighting and believing that we, what we have earned, we deserve. I mean, look at us. We, we're, we're in church on a Sunday morning. Have you seen outside how pretty it is? And we're here. We are dedicated. We deserve a good life or a comfortable life or a rich life or whatever it is. And I tell you, it can be devastating to how we live. So what do you think you're entitled to? Because man, the gospel turns that on its head. And that's what we get to look at this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, would it speak to us? Lord, Father, just uh, guide my words this morning. I pray that you would reveal yourself to us. Show us really your character this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to read Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read through, uh, we're looking at verses 25 through 32 this morning. And if you remember at the beginning of this series, we worked through the first half of the story where there was a younger brother who, who, who came to his father and said, Dad, give me my inheritance. And his, and his father said, um, okay. And he took his inheritance off and he went to a foreign country and he, it says he squandered it on wild living and he ended up... Um, alone and broke, living in a pigsty, longing for the pods that the pigs were eating. And finally, it says that he came to his senses. And when he came, finally came to his senses, he said, man, I, I, I got to get back to my father's house. Maybe he'll take me as a slave, a servant. And so he left and he headed back. But while he was still a long way off, it says, the father saw him. It means the father was waiting for him every morning, looking, acro- looking across the skyline, waiting for his son to return. And while his son was still a long way off, the father saw him and he ran to him and he embraced him. And the son gave him this, this rehearsed line 
uh, Father, I've sinned against you, and, and, and would you just have me back as a servant? And he says, no, 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 no. This son of mine has come home. It's time to celebrate. And it says, but, uh, but the son, of, uh, in verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Remember this from three weeks ago? The, the robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So we, man, if you missed that, go back and listen to that sermon. But man, now we get to move forward. Because this, this, this isn't a story about one prodigal son. This is a story of two prodigal sons. You see, there's an elder brother in the picture. And that's what we get to study this morning because I think it's the perfect picture of entitlement. And it says this, join me while we read. This is uh, verse 25. And it says, meanwhile, the older son, meanwhile, dun, 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 right? The older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, and asked him what was going on. Your brothers come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you, you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. What a perfect picture, I think, of what entitlement does to our lives. I mean, this elder son, when he, when he hears what's going on and he sees what's happened with his younger brother, psh, right, he publicly blames, calls his father out. I think it's exactly what we are so often uh, tempted to fall into as the church. So let's break down what, what's just happened here. The perfect pil- picture of entitlement looks like this. The elder son has good. Let's go back and start looking at this. Meanwhile, the older son in the field came home. So he called one of the servants, asked him what's going on. Your brother's come home. He replied, in fact, okay, go to the next one. Great. All right, now look at, let, let's look at this elder son's response to his father when he hears what's happened. This picture of entitlement. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And the father went out and pleaded with him. What a picture. In the same way the father went out and pleaded or was waiting, met, met the younger son while he was still a long way off. He comes out to the elder son just the same. I love that about God. His father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look. Or, or, or like, look you. That word in the original language literally means behold. As in like when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the elder son starts out by saying that. Behold, like, behold, <laughs> look at me, right? Like, that's crazy. In other words, here I am. Look what I've done. Look at the sum of my accomplishments. You see, entitlement makes us place our trust in ourselves. It always has this narcissistic tendency. He says, look, all these years, all these years, entitlement causes us to live with a fixation on the temporary. Gives us a temporary perspective in life. He says, all these years, what? I have been slaving for you. Because this, this narcissistic tendency has this temporary perspective, and it, and it has this distorted identity. He says, I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. Entitlement makes us misconstrue the nature of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He's not a slave. He's a son. 
causes us to attempt to bargain with God. All these years I've been slaving for you. This distorted identity then leads to a scarcity mentality. Yet, and never did you want to go to the next one? Yet you never gave me even a young goat. What's your proverbial young goat? It causes us to live with a scarcity mentality. Entitlement makes us dissatisfied with what we have and blind to what God is providing. He never gave me anything. And it gives us this outsider personality. But when this son of yours, not this brother of mine, no, he says, this son of yours, right? Makes us an outsider. And Titus severs our God-created and Christ-commissioned connection with a local body he calls church. It breaks our relationship with our brothers and sisters. The son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes. Gives us a judgmental spirit. Entitlement makes us quick to judge others. To judge others. It, it, it actually leads to us uh, sidestepping conflict, right? We'd rather, we'd rather just mm, avoid it rather than actually dealing with it, forgiving others, reconciling it. And it leads to these very ungenerous habits. You killed the fatted calf for him. How dare you? Entitlement makes us stingy and jealous begrudgingly ungenerous with the time and the talent and the treasures God has re, uh, asked us to steward. And in the end, man, we're left with this really common life. And it sounds miserable. And it's so easy to fall into. It's exactly what the world sells. Hey, you got to get ahead, you got to get noticed, you got to get your way, and then you got to get the most toys. That is the common life. Defined by our accomplishments, dictated by approval, determined by ulterior agendas, and in the end, it leads to this path whose destination is dissatisfaction. Where we just accumulate things that don't last. It, 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 there is such a different way to live a totally uncommon life that Jesus invites us into through the power of the gospel. It changes everything. It completely reorients our entire relationships, our relationships with one another and our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our relationship with our stuff, with power, with money. Everything, it, it, it turns it on its head. You were created for an uncommon life. Or, a, or I would say, or a, maybe a life transformed by Christ from the inside out, right? Because let's get something straight. We know what we really deserve, don't we? What we really deserve is complete, total, utter separation from a holy and just heavenly father like that's we deserve we deserve death if we're really honest with ourselves i mean i i do i mean apart from god and from apart from jesus and what he's done it, ephesians expounds on it it sort of explains what the gospel has done for us and it starts like ephesians 2 it says as for you that means me me matt as for me, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, which you used to live in when you were following the ways of this world and the ruler of this kingdom of the air, that common life, and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, 
also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of her flesh, the flowings and, and, and flow, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And he says, man, on our own, that is where this is leading. We're, des- we're dead in our transgressions and sins. Us saying, you know what, God, I'm going to do my own thing. Screw you, I'm doing this. I'm going to live my own way, live by my rules, do my own You were dead in your transgressions and sin, deserving of God's wrath. That's not his angry retribution. God's wrath is his righteous judgment. And who doesn't want a righteous God? So we're stuck. It doesn't stop there. We're stuck on our own, but then there's this big but in verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. And God has raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He says, man, but in Christ, because of his finished work on the cross, because of God's great love and and his rich mercy, we who deserve death are made alive, not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but precisely because we couldn't do it on our own. We are undeserving. He says, even while we were dead in our transgressions, It's by grace that we've been saved, raised, seated, and are showing the incomparable riches of his grace. That's who we get to be because of Jesus and his work. And that changes how we live. It should. It should. I try not to should on you often, but it should. You see, the Father's forgiveness, to come back to this parable that's showing us a whole lot about us and even more about who God is, the Father's forgiveness wasn't free. The Father's forgiveness involved a price, a price that was paid. It was just a price that was impossible for us to pay. So Jesus paid it for us. And it totally reorients us everything in this world and the next. So the, the elder son and his entitlement says, look you, behold, look what all I've done. And you never gave me a goat. <laughs> and then the father responds. And in the few, just two verses, a couple sentences, the father completely destroys all of the perceptions of the elder brother at least for me and my elder brotherness. And the father says in verse 31, this is, this is, our, this is our walk out of entitlement and, and, and walking into that uncommon life in Christ. Ready? The father speaks, my son. The father says. Mm. And the father reminds his son of his identity. We're not slaves, we're children. Ephesians 1, just before the the part that we just read, it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. means that in Christ... We are heirs, co-heirs, children of our Heavenly Father, sons and daughters of the King. We're not slaves, we're sons, he says. He says, my son, the Father says. The gospel transforms us from slaves to children and moves us from duty to choice. He reminds them of his identity. He says, my son, the next thing he says, the Father said, you are always with me. And the father corrects his perspective. See, because of the gospel, in Christ, 
we walk with an eternal, kingdom-minded perspective of the always. The son, remember, remember the, what the son said, right? That common life. All these years, <laughs> all of my 18 years. And the, elder, and the father's like, no, no, no. You, you are always. I want you to live in the always, not all these years. You're with me always. He gives us an eternal kingdom-minded perspective. Perceiving his eternal perspective means that we live for his kingdom, not our own. Hebrews 11 talks about us longing for a better country, that heavenly one, right? Like we have this, we have this, this understanding of how temporary everything is around here, and that changes how we hold it and steward it, care for it loosely. <laughs> so the father says, my son, he reminds me of his identity. You are always with me. He corrects his perspective, and he keeps going. And everything I have is yours. Everything? And he explains where his provision comes from. Everything I have is yours. That means that we operate out of God's abundance, not our scarcity. We hear this, like everything he has is ours. And I'm like, oh man, I hope he has a motor scooter. Because I really want a motor scooter. It's like, what? No! Oh, I, everything I have is yours. Yeah, but if I had a motor scooter, it'd be so cool. And maybe those shoes with the wheels on the back so I could scoot around. Like, those two things would make my life so happy. It's like, no, you're on a, everything I have is yours. Here's the thing. Until we believe this, until we start to comprehend this piece, until we believe that all he has is ours, we will never live like all we have is his. Let me say that again. Until we believe all he has is ours, we're never going to live like all we have is his. It's always going to be like, oh, I'm going to save this bottle for later. I might need it, right? We're going to be like trying to, trying to hoard our stuff. The Father explains where his provision comes from, and then he doesn't stop. In the next line, he says, all I have is yours. You can go to verse 32. You find it? But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. And he's lost and he's found. And in these two verses, the father, right, reminds him of his identity, corrects his perspective, explains where his provision, his real provision comes from. And lastly, he invites him into participation in the family. He gets an invite to the party, to the celebration, right? He goes, we had to celebrate and be glad. We celebrate with the family, participating in God's household. We celebrate at the party, participating in God's extravagant generosity, right? The ring, the robe, the sandals, the fatted calf, the singing and celebration, let's go. He invites us into that. To, to participate. And then he says, we celebrate in the party, and it says, and, and be glad. To celebrate and be glad. That word glad uh, literally is, is to rejoice. The word in the Greek is kairo, and the root word is kairos, keros, which is grace. Rejoicing, being glad is completely rooted. The word literally comes straight out of the word for Grace for God's grace. We're not only participating in God's extravagant, extravagant generosity, we get to revel in God's extravagant grace. Can you imagine what happens to our world if we do those two things? How that transforms Rockbridge County. Jesus, in all of his wisdom, 
doesn't finish the story. Uh Uh-oh, fire alarm. Jesus doesn't finish the story. We don't know what happens to the elder brother, whether, what he ends up doing. He, we, they, we leave the story with him outside the party with a choice to make, and that is totally on purpose because it's our story. It's our choice to make. The Father invites us to participate in his extravagant generosity and revel in his extravagant grace. Imagine what happens if we do. Join the party. (laughs) Don't sit outside in the parking lot smoking Marlboros. Don't sit on the side in the seats like figuring out which girls are wearing the same dress. Join the party. Don't miss out. It's a ball. We don't just go to the party and have to leave at the Mocha Strid night. We get to go at the stroke of midnight. We get to go. Put on the party. Enjoy it. Host it. He invites us to be a part of the family. Receiving his extravagant grace means we live with his extravagant generosity. This is the uncommon life we are called to. Can you imagine what happens if we do? How our worlds are transformed. How our relationships are transformed. How our younger brothers are drawn to the extravagant grace of their father. Man, can you imagine like, what, what would happen in our worlds? You know, in a few weeks, uh, I'm going to update us on the vision, uh, on the, our 10-year vision for Rockbridge Church and give you some updates of that and hit some of the benchmarks. And I'm also going to invite you to begin to give financially, regularly, and generously because I want you to be a part of the party. God wants to do a big thing in a small town, but it takes the people of faith and generosity. Imagine what could happen Imagine uh, if all of the people of Rockbridge Church, just our church, decided that we were going to live off of 90% of everything God has given us and we were going to give him back 10%. If we tithed regularly, imagine what would happen. I can. (laughs) We would have about a $1.5 million budget every year. That's three times what it currently is. That means we could give away a million dollars a year as Rockbridge Church. Imagine what would happen if that happened. You're not telling me that wouldn't impact the world around us? I can't can't even, like, begin to fathom that. Like, you don't think that changes people's perception of Jesus and his church? I think it does. Imagine if the church was the biggest philanthropic foundation in our community. Mind-blowing stuff, man. Imagine what would happen if every word that came out of our mouth, either to people or about people, was just bathed in extravagant grace. How might that reshape the younger brother's perception of their father? Imagine what would happen. It's not impossible. The gospel says it is. It is possible. So, may you understand, receive, be transformed by the power of of the finished work of Jesus Christ and the good news of his gospel. And may that not stay on the inside. (laughs) That we would understand and live in his extravagant generosity and just be bathed in his extravagant grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your good word and for your goodness 
man, thank you for giving us a picture of what it might look like in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would live for that kingdom and not our own. Thank you for your extravagant generosity that you poured out on us, on me, while I was still just chasing my entitled brat self. You met me there and you changed my life. Continue to change our lives. Thank you for your grace. In your Father, in your heavenly name we pray. Amen.